Hey guys, welcome back. This is Mad Shit, episode 512. Featuring an interview with Jimmy Marr, the digital antiquarian. Now, Jimmy has a fantastic blog. It's supported by Patreon, so if you like what he has to say here, uh, be sure to go check out his Patreon page, sign up for that. Uh, he also does a non-gaming blog called Analog Antiquarian. Uh, but in this interview, we talk about a lot of stuff, game history, game preservation, uh, Magic of the Gathering and bringing that to, uh, to screens. We talk about AI, The Last Express, and believe it or not, porn. <laughs> no worry, it's, it's safe for work, but uh, I think you'll be quite entertained by uh, Jimmy's take on uh, all these topics and more. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Jimmy Marr. You probably have gone to so many of those things that you don't remember, but... Um... I, my time in academia was much shorter, so. <laughs> yeah, Texarkana. But maybe it, it could be it was somebody else, but it's like I, a pop I, culture pop culture thing seems like our. Time. Um, it was a it was it was called computers and writing. Oh yeah, I've been to that many times. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and uh, as I remember, it was probably around 2007 2008 something like that and um i had just published uh my kind of my first games writing piece on um uh, a history of interactive fiction uh -huh. uh, text adventures in other words and you you said that you had read it and that you were working on or thinking about writing a history like that of rpg games and of course, I actually have your book on my shelf. Um, it's your dungeons, oh, wow. dungeons and desktops, was it? Oh yeah, I got a. Let's you know, I have that thing handy. I don't know if I have my copy handy. Yeah, I have one somewhere over there as well. Yeah. There we go. Since you mentioned it, I'm always happy to. <laughs> this is the old one. <laughs> yeah, that's the one I have. The new one's got a artistic rendition. Yeah, okay. Did you have a new edition? Or? Yeah, second edition came out a few years ago. I don't know. If I, let me see if I got that one here. Today. Yeah, Jamie, this one's even bigger and beefier. Oh, okay. It's also a paperback. Cover, yeah, it's got the... <laughs> There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun writing both of these. Some of my favorite projects, you know. Yeah, yeah. Who would have thought they'd let you get away with research like that? You know? <laughs> okay. So um, you you just you take it away and do whatever you would like to do here. <laughs> I'm at your disposal. I oh, forgot. Did you get the little recording permission button? Thing? Yes, I got the recording permission. Oh, yeah, Jimmy. Where do we even start? I I think we might do something here today that we've never done. On Mad Chat. Okay. That is to talk. We've done about, a lot of Mad Chats, so. Talking about porn. <laughs> ah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, I think, this is your latest. Uh, yeah, I published that about 10 yeah. days ago. Or this, you got a, the Patreon. I guess you get the sneak, the early access to it. Is that how it works? And then you... uh, no, actually, um Patre Patreon people get nothing. <laughs> Extra. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've take asked. Our money, Jimmy. <laughs> I've asked from time to time, you know, um, should we, are you interested in doing special chats or something? And I've never really gotten a big response from it. So I think most of the people that are interested in supporting me are happy to do so uh, just on the basis that I will be able to create more articles and, um, well, that's how it should be. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, um, it's not, I, I don't do anything special other than thank them a whole lot because, of course, I could not do this well, uh, without, without their support. Yeah. Yeah, that's fun. I, I, you made sort of a, I guess, a nice business model out of doing, I should have thought about this. <laughs> you know, I'd much <laughs> rather write uh, blo uh, books and blogs. Yeah, it's something I, I can give no advice because I did everything wrong and just kind of stumbled into it. Um, 
honestly, I, I started the blog as a as a kind of a hobby project. I was I'd finished up writing a book and I wanted to keep writing, keep my hand in at that. And so for the first two or three years, it was strictly a hobby project. I was uh, working. Oh my God, I'm young there. I need to update that photograph. Um, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the beauty of it. You just stay. <laughs> yeah, that's about 15 years ago. So um, yeah, so I I was just doing this as a as a hobby, and then this I heard about this Patreon thing came around, and a few people said, "Oh, you should try that out." And yeah, I noticed back then you said you hadn't uh, achieved your dreams of playing to a stadium full of screaming <laughs> girls. Right? Yeah, so I had to go for Plan B exactly. Yeah. So um, yeah, so I I just I set up a Patreon kind of to see what happened. And uh, there were a, a couple of people for whom, to whom I will always be eternally grateful who came in with really big pledges right at the beginning. Like um, it's one fellow who pledged like $50 an article <laughs> and um, actually- You uh, buy the article. <laughs> yeah, and um, actually Jonathan Blow, the game developer, um, pledged like $25 an article. Oh, wow. And so I was thinking, wow, I didn't even know that Jonathan Blow was reading anything that I wrote. So that's, so that's he nice. He's a well-informed developer. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so and, and they kind of, this is something I've heard from other people who have Patreons that you kind of need some people to prime the pump because if there's a little bit of money coming in already, then other people, it's kind of a, it's a human psychology situation where other people are willing suddenly to kick in as well. And um, so, so, so that kind of, they kind of primed the pump for me and then um, it went from there. So, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so, so grateful to, to those folks for, for jumping in there in the beginning. And of course, I'm grateful to everybody who I'm just amazed still that I write something and there are people who pay for what I write who don't have to pay for what I write. I mean, that's, that's a really, uh, uh, honor, I would say. Beautiful so, yeah. but you do such good work, Jimmy, on these articles. I mean, these are you delve deep. Yeah, I try um, to do the best I possibly can. And as as you're a creative <laughs> person, you you know that it's um, you kind of have to do the best you can in the time you have, and then let it go. And so I really, really try to make every article I write the best that it can be. And then uh, probably if I look back on it a year or two later, I'll say, oh, God, that's terrible. Why didn't I do that? Why didn't I do that? But um, why did I write that? That was that's that was a terrible turn of phrase, whatever. But, um, you know, you turn you, you just do the best you can in the time at the time. And you have to accept that. So. Well, that's yeah. the beauty of the blog. I guess you could update it at some point if you get enough of those. Yeah, that's actually you know, something that... All the time to me, and they're like, oh, what about this game? Or what about this? Yeah. Got this little detail wrong? Or... Yeah, for me, um, I have a kind of a small army at this point of fact checkers. So I'm always guaranteed when I, when I publish a new article that there will be several things that I got wrong and they tell me. And of course, then I can fix it right off. Um, I look back at the at the old, really old articles when it was just a hobby project, and those are the ones that I really cringe at <laughs> these days. And um, sometimes I actually think, well, should I go back all the way to the beginning and just do this stuff properly so it reads, you know, up to my standards of today? But um, my problem is I have too much fun in the late 1990s. Right now, the games are really really, really good. And so I just, I, I have trouble wanting going back. I'm not a person that likes to go back. So no. yeah, I'm kind of the, I guess the opposite of that. I look at my old stuff and think, wow, that's so much better than the crap I'm doing now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think any writer is always dissatisfied um, in one way or another. So yeah. You don't want to feel like you're, you've reached a point of perfection, I guess. And yeah, 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 exactly. 
everybody's always got some room to grow, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. So you started off in, you're living in Denmark, I believe now, right? Is that the... Yes, I am. I've lived here since 2009, so quite some years now. Um, lived for two years in Norway, but other than that, I've been in Denmark. You like it over there? The I do, yeah. It was a really, really hard transition in the beginning, um, moving to a new country, a new culture. Of course, it's not the most different culture from the United States. Um, could have moved to Egypt or something, and it would have been much more different. But, um, yeah, it was it was a struggle at the beginning, and I don't know if I would do it again if I had the, the advantage of jumping into something like that is you don't know how hard it's going to be. And then once you do it, you're kind of stuck with it. And it's just a matter of working through it. And so um, er, early on, I would say um, the, the writing was a little bit of a lifeline for me because I, I, it was quite hard for me uh, being in this foreign culture that I didn't, I was struggling to learn the language and so on. And um not the easiest language to learn either. Um, it's a uh, the Danish is the the grammar and so on is is really easy. So oh. in that sense, it's 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 an easy language in that sense. Oh. Um, but the the pronunciation can be difficult and uh, can be hard to understand because even the other Scandinavians say that um, Danes have they call them hot they call them hot potato mouths because. A lot of Danes don't enunciate that well, <laughs> and so they go around. Woo, woo, woo. They sound like they have they, they have potatoes in their mouths. So, um, so that so so that's and that's that's a really terrible feeling um, as an immigrant uh, when somebody says something to you and you don't know what they said, and then you think then it's a question. Okay, do I guess what they said and and go from there or? Do I say, I don't know what you said? And then often they would, when I would do that, they would switch to English. And that I always took that as a failure as a, in a way because I wanted to communicate in their language. And so, um, so yeah, that was, that was really hard for me. And I'm not, oddly enough, although I like to think I'm a pretty good writer in English, I'm not good with languages. So it's, it took some time for me to feel comfortable here. But now, uh, when I go back to the United States and look around, especially in the recent era of, of politics and things, um, I, I just think, okay, what, <laughs> what, what is with this country? This is, a, this is not, not the United States in a way seems almost odder to me than, than Denmark. So, yeah. There are a lot of things that come out of that, I guess, corner of the world that I've noticed. And that's a lot of academics game yeah. study academic game study yeah yes for you is here um yeah it's a pretty good scene there for yeah there's it university of copenhagen is one of the bigger um in academic institutions involved in game studies and i actually when i first came here i that was kind of my plan that I was going to stay in academia. Um, I had gotten a master's degree just before leaving the States. And um, then I wrote a book for the MIT press on the Commodore Amiga, the personal computer. And my whole idea was that that was going to be kind of my entree into um, a PhD program that I would have this um, book that I could have on my CV and that would be my leg up. So I started to apply around here in Europe and I actually um, decided at some point that I didn't want to do the academia thing. And I think a lot of it was just the style of writing and so on was not for me. I, so- um, we pause for one second? Yeah, sure. But yeah, this is a great book. Uh, let me- Share the Amazon page, I guess. The future was here. Yeah. Platform studies. That's the boing ball, space balls. My original name for that was oh, a rough God. draft of the future. And they but they the editor at the MIT Press told me that was not good because you don't want to call a book a rough draft <laughs> under any circumstances. So mm -hmm. we ended up with the future was here. 
So that's what started it all. I mean, that's pretty prestigious publication. Yeah, um, that was that was my big that was my big strategy that I was gonna have that book, and then I was gonna uh, get into some great PhD program here in Europe. And um, I applied to I I don't think I ever actually applied to any because the more that I got into it, uh, the process of applying and and researching and so on, uh, the more I just felt like no, I don't want to do this. <laughs> so, so I ended up uh, doing contract programming for, for several years. Um, and I did mobile programming. I started doing, uh, there, was a, there was a thing called uh, Kindle. Uh, Amazon for the Kindle had an active content program for a while where they were trying to make little games that would run on these Kindle e-readers. And so I started out doing that. Uh, and I ported several I, several IF games, uh, text adventures to the Kindle. And um, then Amazon decided that they weren't going to um, do games on Kindle anymore, which was probably a good idea. It was a terrible platform for games. Yeah, it's a little and, slow for the keyboard. Yeah, yeah, you have this e-ink screen. It's just, it's just slow, it's so great. slow. So then I... Um, I started doing uh, with this actually the same folks that I was working with uh, doing the Kindle programming. I started doing Android programming and then moved on to, if you start doing Android programming, you always end up doing iOS programming as well at some point because everybody needs one of each app. So, um, so yeah, and then I just kind of never went back to the, to the PhD stuff. And um, I have, honestly, I have, I, I don't have any regrets. I think it was the right decision. Not that there's anything. Got nothing, wrong I got with... nothing but regrets. You got... <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with PhDs, but um, it's just, it just wasn't the, wasn't the route for me. So. Yeah, I don't know what it was like for you. I always felt like as if I could just get it, my dream was always just, can I get a book? Yeah. Can I write a book and publish it, you know, and then once I get this book out, then, Everything will, <laughs> yeah, the lights will come on, the future will be bright, you know. Yeah, I had it the same. I, I thought that uh, the, this this Amiga book is the key to my whole future. <laughs> and then it came out and I was, and then the, the other frustrating thing about it is that when you're working with an academic press, especially, you submit the book, it's all done, and then you wait. And then you wait some more and then you wait some more and finally you get feedback. So you respond. Actually, I started the blog to, in the middle of all this whole waiting process because I thought, well, I want, to, I want to be a good writer. I want to keep writing. So I have to, the only, the only way to be a good writer, of course, is the, is just the same as to be good at anything, you have to do it. You have to do it every day or at least every week. And so um, that's kind of where the blog came from originally. Um, and at the beginning, it wasn't even uh, this whole history project that I'm on now. It wasn't that at all. It was just kind of a personal blog. I'm just going to write what I'm interested in. But then I, one of the things I got interested in was this, um, old game called the Oregon Trail. Oh, sure. So I'm sure, I'm sure you remember. I came everybody out of Minnesota. From, I came yeah, out of Minnesota. Everybody from our generation remembers it. And yeah, you're right. It came out of Minnesota. Yes. Minnesota was very, very innovative with uh, school uh, computers and schools in the 70s and early 80s. And so I started, I got interested in this game and I started uh, asking myself, uh, where did this, what is the earliest version of this game that I can find? Because I knew that it actually predated microcomputers. Um, it originally came out on HP mini computers. And um, so I, I started looking for the oldest version I could find. The Holy Grail for me was to be uh, the 1971 version, the, the very first version. I never did find it, but I hooked up with these uh, kind of this group of old timers 
um, who archived a bunch of old tapes and so on from these HP systems and was able to find a version in BASIC from, I think, 1975 is the date on it. Wow, that's and, really early. <laughs> yeah, that's really early. And so I, I, I had the original BASIC code and then I um, got it running on an HP 9000 series emulator. And um, that was kind of the beginning. And then uh, people were more interested in that than anything else I was writing about. So <laughs> then after that, I think I said, well, I'm going to write about Eliza, the, the original chatbot, which is quite relevant today. Um, the ninth, but the 1966 chatbot, of course, was just a parlor trick. Um, and so I wrote about that, and then um, it kind of just confide your deepest, that. darkest secrets to Eliza. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it was so funny. Um, of course, this this chatbot would just you would say, she would say, um, uh, "What do you want to talk about today?" And you would say, "Oh, I'm having a really hard, bad day." And then she would say, "Why do you think you're having a really hard, bad day?" And so it was just these kind of linguistic tricks that it was just it was just turning your sentences around and and coming back. But um, the the crazy thing is that that in the late nineteen sixties, people really thought this was um, a serious application of a computer, and there was even talk from like the psychologist unions saying that oh, we're afraid we're going to be put out of business because every instead of going to a human psychologist, everybody will just load up Eliza on their computer. Eliza's hey, and, and, not going to judge you. No. Right, right, yeah. So if you're familiar if you're familiar with that, then it's, it's really funny to watch this whole brouhaha we have going on now with chat GPT and what will it do and what won't it do and you know, how will it affect society and so on. I suspect that in the end it will become just another tool like like any other tool. But in, I think it's in more probably, than a parlor, more than a parlor trick. Or? Oh well I think it's it's certain certainly will be um, more than a parlor trick, but I don't think it's going to end the world as <laughs> as some people the seem Atlantic to believe. Burian, the chat yeah. the edition. <laughs> That's a real big deal. Could bring it back to academe. I mean, all the, my colleagues are just completely freaked out by this thing because the students are. Oh yeah, yeah. I, can I mean, every single one seems like is using it to write all their. I mean, forget about essays and <laughs> responses. Yeah. And poems. It's just. Yeah, yeah. You have to. I would guess you have to change your whole teaching habits uh, to to account for it. Yeah, I um I ha also have a have an, quite a number of friends still that are programmers because I was in that world for quite some time and um they all love chat GPT because it does 90% of your work for you. You just tell it what you want, it kicks out code, and then you just go through the code and uh correct the little mistakes and bugs and errors and things. And um you you can churn out programs two or three times the pace so it's definitely definitely going to have a big effect on society but and kind of um, feel like as you know somebody who teaches writing classes i feel like the math teacher must have felt back when the pocket calculators yeah. really got to be a oh uh, yeah yeah but i mean at least i can say well you have to show me your work i don't need to see a rough draft yeah yeah <laughs> back to that and then the final draft you know there's that sort of there needs to be some revision and some editing done. Otherwise, it's pretty obvious that. And you've had you've had papers submitted that you suspect were written oh, by Chat GPT. Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Many. Is there a is there a kind of a style that you come to recognize? Okay, this is Chat GPT. Yeah, I think so. You know, there's various uh, chat bot detectors, AI detector. Uh, yeah. Com type you know services i don't know how reliable those are now notice what some people do uh instead of just going straight to chat gpt and saying write my paper for me you know here's the prompt yeah or they'll find somebody else's draft and then they'll cop it'll feed that into chat gpt and say can you paraphrase this 
you know, that's what they're doing with the commercial books too. I've noticed a lot on Amazon. Uh, somebody will feed. I don't know if it's Chat GPT. You know, just mm-hmm. some version of that software, right? And they'll uh, feed a book through it, and then they'll ask for a paraphrase or a summary, and then they'll put that on Amazon. Actually, sell it as a uh, they call it a workbook or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that with my blog entries. Actually, my articles. Um, there are these shady sites that take the art, take the text of the article. They feed it through some sort of a algorithm, so it will put like use synonyms for the the words that I choose and change the sentence structure around a little bit, and then it will they'll publish it on their own website. And of course it reads awful, (laughs) but, but it's, but it's, it's something I've seen quite a lot. Yeah. Dungeons and desktopers, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. I remember hearing this. The first people I heard complaining about this was uh, not writers, but artists. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of graphic designers and artists, computer, uh, you're doing computer graphics and just maybe even paintings. And they were really concerned. They're like, this thing is, you know, stealing our work and yeah. you know, people are uh, using it to generate artwork. They're cutting us. We're not getting paid, <laughs> even though it's yeah, using yeah. our stuff. So Well, and you could say that, that writers can have the same concerns because it's scraping the web and using all of our works yeah. and um, incorporating that into its responses. So there's a, there's a huge field, field of uh, legal, <laughs> legal questions out there that, are not have not been answered that that are going to have to be answered at some point you know i find really fascinating about it just i don't know how much the audience cares about academics but (laughs) uh, but you can edit this part out (laughs) when i ask it uh because i've played around with it a lot it's just fun to play with yeah Uh, but i'll ask it for something like uh, can you generate some sources like a works cited page about this topic I could probably say computer role-playing game history, you know, and it'll spit out, it'll make up these sources, but it'll have like the actual, actual names of scholars will be in there, but it's linking to, or uh, suggesting titles that don't exist. (laughs) Yeah, I've I've actually heard that before, and that's really strange. Why is it not smart enough to just take books that already exist and just put them in there? That's I find that I find that odd that it's that it's making stuff up that way. I find it odd, but also useful for somebody because a lot of the times students come to me and they're they know what topic they want to write about, but they don't have any ideas, you know, for like what kind of what would I write about this topic? So I you know get the list of the fake. <laughs> <we're> excited, <laughs> like well, there's a bunch of you know it's I mean they all sound like something you'd want to read, right? Mm-hmm. So that's a pretty good way to brainstorm. Yeah, yeah, actually, that is, yeah. You know, I don't know if it's, you know, I don't know if it actually knows the real sources and it's paraphrasing them, or maybe it's just, I like to think, I'm probably giving it too much credit here, <laughs> but it's like trying to find gaps, you know, things that don't exist yet. Yeah. You know, like a, like the periodic table, maybe there's some, you know, how they use that, there would be some, well, we know there should be something here in this box and we just haven't discovered yeah. the, the element. I, I like to think it's that kind of thing, because that'd be really cool. Uh, and you teach English composition 101 or uh yeah, we usually teach business writing and games. I got a game studies course actually going yeah, on. Okay, okay. And do your do your students know that you have this sideline in, in games <laughs> history? <laughs> do they think you're the coolest Some professor might, ever? <laughs> you should probably try to promote it more. They're usually pretty impressed, like, oh, you have a YouTube channel. <laughs> Well, I, uh, yeah, yeah, and then they'll say, "Well, you must, do you, you know, Metal Jesus rocks." You know, I get that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> know, yeah, but you're not as many as you think. Yeah, I have this. I have this friend here in Denmark who has four boys um, from age. I think the oldest is fourteen now, down to about age six. And they're all, as as most kids today, they're crazy about video games. Oh, so sure. before I ever met them for the first time, my friend told them that, you know, that I write about video games. That's what I do. And um, they were just so excited to meet me and so on. And then, but I think I, think I was a huge disappointment to them because they would come up to me and ask me about this new game and or this this game and, 
And I, I know nothing, <laughs> almost nothing about, about what's Fortnite. going on today. Fort, you must know Fortnite, and you know you must be really yeah. good at esports and things. And I'm like, no, yeah, yeah. no. If you want to talk about some crusty old, <laughs> you know, CD-ROM game, I'm your guy. But yeah, uh, yeah. So then, um, and and what it, the really odd thing to me was that even the notion of a single player game is something that they kind of have trouble with, because everything that they do in, in relation to games is online. Um, they're they're into Roblox and um, Steam, um, Steam communities, and and all of these multiplayer games, and so the idea of a game, especially like a narrative adventure game or RPG game, where you get the game, you play it by yourself, and you go through a story, and you get to the end of the game, and you say, okay, I'm done, I beat that game, is really, really a foreign, foreign notion to them. And I'm not sure if it's better or worse. It's just different um, because you could say that well, they're using games as a as a as a community um, building exercise, which is probably better than sitting in your room by yourself as a as a little boy as I did, <laughs> and, you know, playing through playing through these games. But um, yeah, it's 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 just it's just constantly amazes me how different their world is from from the world of games that that i grew up in and that i'm i still am most connected to one of the games that i was kind of impressed with their response was uh what remains of edith finch yeah i put i had that on the syllabus and every i think pretty much every one of the students was just like blown away by yeah. that like, yeah. this is the most amazing game and <laughs> this will stay with me forever you know yeah yeah i'm like okay i feel a little better now <laughs> <laughs> yeah i've i've heard of it i've never i've never played it but i've heard of it well it's a lot you know the, it's really kind of a more of a narrative thing yeah i would i wasn't expecting them to like it so much you know because of that to me it's more like some of the old um adventure games you know than anything mm -hmm. um, but yeah they just they loved it <laughs> so, well, that's great yeah. yeah maybe i'm kind of seeding uh you know some <laughs> uh well let's see we, we need to get to porn <laughs> <laughs> porn waits for no man <laughs> yeah this was uh, just fascinating to me and we've got to get to Magic the Gathering, two people probably wondering, like, why has he got Magic the Gathering on? It's coming, folks. Just be patient. But, yeah, this was a really fascinating look. I mean, you take this all the way back to those, uh, yeah, Venus <laughs> figurines. Yeah, that's my that's my little historical introduction to porn. <laughs> you know, I've heard about this. Yeah, Chaucer's in there. And it's really amazing the depth, the comprehensiveness of this. You know this look uh, into this, but one of your points, I think, was that this uh, interest. Yeah, the yeah, there's a soft porn adventure <laughs> this year online. <laughs> I like this uh, sort of interest in people don't realize the extent, I guess, that uh, the porn industry plays in spurring technology and innovation. Yeah, the classic the classic example, of course, is the video cassette. So um, in the in the mid 1970s, uh, it became possible for the first time to watch movies in your home, mm -hmm. and so there were there were millions and millions of people who were curious about porn, but would never go to a porn theater, and you know you don't yeah. don't want to think about what's on the seat <laughs> when, when you sit down. And um, would just never go to, you know, the wrong side of town and, and be in that environment. But um, if you give them a way to watch porn uh, anonymously at home, then they're, they're going to be all over that. And so um, there's this statistic that uh, so that I think the first video cassette players came out in 1975. And by 1978 and 1979, uh, three quarters of all the movies that were being sold on videotape were actually pornography. And it wasn't until that percentage gradually went down in the 1980s because the technology became cheaper, became more mainstream. 
but in the beginning it was really really driven by porn and um so that's that's kind of the classic example and um computers were a little different because of course you don't the early computers didn't have the best visuals <laughs> so so there wasn't there wasn't quite that that appeal to computers in the beginning but as you said even even with them um, in 1981 you had soft porn which was not porn in spite of the name it was a leisure yeah. suit larry kind of game where you have a loser trying to uh, score with women and but it's very pg-13 um but but uh, i mean i remember also when i was when i was um in the 1980s when i that was the high point of my pirating time when i would when i was on all these pirate bbs's and collecting uh discs make a guy pirating why well, i've never heard of such a thing <laughs> yeah yeah you would never have done such a thing i'm no, sure but, but um then i had i bought I had every this... blank disc <laughs> yeah, you bought all your discs they were just blank. I the that's how i supported the game <laughs> so um then there was these these strip poker games that, that me and all my friends had and they were um there were several there were several different discs you could get and they would all have different women that you could play with and um and i remember when i had my amiga there was all there were all these discs full of just pictures that would get passed around i mean because... does that ham mode exist for any other purpose I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah well this was and again it's just um it, to to a somebody of a later generation, it's it's hard to explain, but um, porn was not accessible. <laughs> if you if you wanted to if you wanted to get a glimpse of a of a naked woman, then you had to you had to put some effort in. And so um, when the when the and Amiga came, poker. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when the Amiga came around, and um, suddenly suddenly you could have pictures on the monitor screen i mean that was just unbelievable even outside of the context of porn <laughs> it was just unbelievable to have a a photo on the, on a computer monitor screen and um so yeah i remember um uh i remember that whenever i would have when i would have friends who, who would come over who had like ibms or uh, 8-bit computers or something and they would want to see my amiga always always within an hour or so the door would the bedroom door would get closed keep the parents out and then you know the the special discs come out so <laughs> yeah the special discs yeah. <laughs> yeah i think it's one of the nice things about i mean it's it's great writing just the whole piece i think there'll be a series here but you talked a little bit yeah <laughs> he came from the desert guy <laughs> uh, but how these early video games got they were so notorious just the media kind of latched on to this these games and made such a big whoop about them but i mean really they were very tame mm. you know they're really nothing there that you know could even i mean cinemax would be <laughs> way worse than what yeah we're... yeah definitely yeah i mean so what was up with that why did games just take so much heat you know well i think it was because in the eyes of the culture um, the the adult culture yeah. uh video games certainly through the 1980s into the 1990s they were something that kids did and so if you're selling a game with any kind of sex or risque aspect to it then you're selling that to children in their minds anyway and so um yeah so it was and and of course everybody was afraid of the backlash so if you wanted to make a game that was more risque than Leisure Suit Larry or something, that was about as far as you could go, um, you just wouldn't get distribution. And in those days, if a distribution, if a distributor wouldn't handle your stuff, then you were nowhere because then you couldn't get onto store shelves. And that was the way games were sold, of course. Um, so, so I think, everybody was kind of running scared and there's this this so this there's this voyeur game which is kind of a classic example um it's supposed to be this really you know 
boundary pushing game where you're this you're this detective who is supposed to look into the windows of um, a presidential candidate's house and see what him and his family are getting up to and you're watching and so you have this uh, as you see on the screen there right now you have this um a uh, lesbian love affair going on and um there's another there's a man and a woman who are doing this bdsm stuff and all this um all this stuff going on but at the same time you never actually see anything it's always the camera you know cuts away at the at the perfect moment or they get interrupted somehow before you know they really get started and so and so, you know, they want to be risque, but at the same time, they're afraid of the backlash. And so it's, and so that's the line they're walking. And um, as you say, looking at it today or even back at the time, I mean, you could see, you could see stuff way worse on Cinemax or Skinemax as me and my friends used to, used to call it. <laughs> the Spice Channel. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> actually the way the way i got into the writing this article somebody suggested that i write about a game that's called blue heat blue it's a, heat it's a super obscure game and it was an it was an unusual game in that it wasn't it it was obviously uh it was much more hardcore than voyeur or something so there was just topless women everywhere in this game and um, but at the same time, it tried to be a serious adventure game in the sense that there was a real plot and uh, puzzles to solve. And um, the plot of the game was that you were a woman who went undercover uh, to investigate the murder of uh, another woman who was a model uh, for this uh photographer who took these nudie shots and then she was involved in this kind of high class escort in industry so this whole kind of underground um, sex industry that was that that was in Los Angeles um, in the 1990s and so you you went and you investigated this case and then um, because you were you know going to strip clubs and nudie uh, uh, photography sessions and so on then you would always suddenly there would be boobies in your face constantly and so it's this really weird dichotomy where you've got this conventional adventure game and then you've got all these um this booby shots going on and it was very much it's cinemax level so you never saw anything other than breasts but um mm -hmm. but it was it was um and in the end it just wasn't that interesting I mean, I'm too old to get excited about so excited about that stuff anymore. And um, the game itself was just very bland and uh, not a good game at all. So plus it was broken. There was some sort of a bug where it would just crash halfway through. And um, so I ended up not even writing about that game, but that kind of set me off down the path toward... Uh, doing this it's just a it's just going to be a two-part series um the next the next piece will be on uh porn on the internet which is a fascinating <laughs> subject in itself Imagine in that everything. everything on the internet kind of came from porn um the first guy who figured out how to take credit card transactions on the internet he set up a company that did it largely for um all the people that were setting up porn sites um, there's there's this hilarious Wired article from 1997 that I found where they say, um, you know, people, the only thing on the Internet right now that people will pay for is porn. <laughs> and so, so all of the e-commerce, um, the affiliated marketing, the, um, the advertising that we have today, the, the click through advertising and all of those algorithms. Um, all of that stuff, even even streaming video years before YouTube, um, it was all put together for porn. And then it just as as was the case with the videotape industry, it, it ex then it started in porn and then it's expanded out to encompass other other fields of endeavor, shall we say. <laughs> but um, 
yeah, it's it's just it's 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 just a weird story. Um, it's just very it's a very human story. Um, I'm not sure I'm not sure what to think about it, but but it's it's just it's just a fascinating story. This uh, is this Faye Sharp, I believe, and I'm actually not sure if that's her or not. Um, I I I found this uh, connected with an article that that would that that had her as an interview subject uh, okay. but i don't it didn't actually explicitly say in the picture in the caption of the picture if that was her or not so i don't know if that's her or if that's just a kind of a booth babe there at the at the adult decks uh conference so exhibition i should say i can't imagine i guess there could be a porn conference but um adult decks was more of an exhibition and this was sort of at the uh, yeah ninety nineteen ninety five so really when the the CD ROM yeah the, this is when the CD ROM yeah was yeah that, yeah and there's another uh, there's surprise another... people are using CD ROMs for <laughs> <laughs> there's another kind of story when that's missed, connected that's connected with that because when CD uh, when when CD ROM yeah CD. when S E E D Y C D ROM yeah. Um, when people first started, when, when CD-ROM first came around, um, there was this belief that it would be this new publishing medium. Mm -hmm. And so um, you had companies like Voyager Interactive who were doing, um, uh, they were doing CDs based on Shakespeare plays and astronomy and um, yeah, mom, I need baseball. This for and... I need this for Shakespeare. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can get Macbeth, the Voyager Macbeth. And um, they were doing, so they were doing all, it was quite, it was quite interesting, innovative stuff, a lot of it. Um, but then it's the internet took off, the web took off and just killed it dead because um, if you can publish on the web, why, why would you publish on CD? And so, especially once the web really got, got rolling and, and once um, people started being able to access it a little bit faster. So you started to have the streaming video and um, better, better visual, audio visual possibilities, and it just killed the CD ROM. And it was kind of the same thing with porn <laughs> on CD ROM or a CD ROM. Um, once the web came around, it just killed, killed the whole, this whole underground industry dead. And it's kind of bringing back these long repressed memories. I, I remember being a lab monitor at my college this would have been like 95 96 mm -hmm. somewhere in there and there was one of the big things we had to do <laughs> oh god <laughs> these dudes that would come in and like go to the very back of the lab you know <laughs> and they'd, you'd walk over there you know and they'd quickly switch to like excel or something but you yeah. know <laughs> that was the thing we oh god <laughs> like don't you have a you know don't you have a desktop at your dorm or something you know <laughs> yeah common yeah, uh but okay let's uh, uh jump the rails a little bit i guess uh because you, you got a great one about the last express too thanks no this is a fascinating game jordan um is it mechner mechner um i've always said mechner but mechner okay well i was wrong <laughs> two different but ways. But I, I, I don't know that I've ever heard it said. So so you could be right. I don't know. I just I've always said Mechner. That seemed the most natural to me. Yeah, so what made you want to write about this one? Um well uh my kind of special interest has always been the narrative driven games. Mm -hmm. Um I'm a big fan of of adventure games, although they frustrate me a lot, but I'm I'm a fan of them. Um, conceptually, I would say sometimes the sometimes the reality of them is a little more frustrating. But um, so yeah, this this was something that I had played with um, back in the day. Not everything I write about is a game that I played back then, of course. But um, this was one that I remembered well, and um, it's really got an interesting backstory behind it. Um, so Jordan Mechner um, did Prince of Persia, of course. That's what everybody knows him for. And um, before that, he did 
karateka or karataka. There's also a debate over, <laughs> over how that is said. Uh, but he had these two huge hit games on the Apple II in the 1980s. And so, um, but he Ruined was- Ruined games, I mean, incredible. Yeah, yeah, they're they're very. He was he was very very interested in film, and he was always uh, kind of dividing his energy. Do I want to be a filmmaker? Or do I want to be a game developer? And so you can really see in those games how his film interests informed the games, um, and also in The Last Express, I would say. But um, so he did the first Prince of Persia game. He finished right at the end of 1989, and then he kind of just took off and he was making, he had made a lot of money off these games. And so um, he spent a couple of years. Uh, he went, he, he lived in Paris and traveled all around Europe. Um, he is not like me in the sense that he apparently had an amazing gift for languages. And so he was, he went to Europe and within a year he was speaking fluent uh, French and Spanish. And, um, having all kinds of adventures. And Probably at one point- a lot of trains, we guess so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, at, at one point um, he, he was thinking seriously about going to film school and he actually uh, went to Cuba, which was as even more so than today, it was kind of a closed unknown society. Um, and he made a 20 minute documentary in Cuba. He was going to use that as kind of a demo reel to uh, hopefully get him into film school. But um, there was a woman who worked at Bruderbund, um, not directly at Bruderbund, but she kind of worked with Bruderbund software or Broderbund. I always want to say Bruderbund because it has this O with the tr through it and the Danish pronunciation, you would say Broderbund, but probably Broderbund is more appropriate. Um, so anyway, um, there was this woman named uh, Tommy Pierce who who called him as he tells as they both tell the story. Um, called him one day and said, uh, "What are you doing, Jordan? You've been two years now just bumming around in Europe, and why don't you get back here and make a game?" And um, so they, and then she actually gave him an idea. She said, what about a game where um, you're on a train and it's, where it's on a train during World War II, a night train to Berlin during World War II. And they started talking about this idea. They started talking every day over the um, transatlantic telephone. And um, she, they, they refined the idea until it became World War I instead of World War II. And then they had this idea that the train you would be on would be the Orient Express. Um, very and accurate. it would be, yeah, and very, very, very well known for, from all kinds of media. And then it would be the last uh, voyage or the last journey of the Orient Express before World War I started. So you would have all these kind of dominoes falling in Europe that were going to lead to the war and you would have all this possibility for intrigue on the train. And um, they just absolutely, so then Jordan in January of 2000, oh, sorry, January of 1993, he decided I wanna make this game. And so he moved back to San Francisco and um, poured a huge amount of his own money into all this money that he had made from Prince of Persia, basically he took all of that and poured it into this game. This was going to be his masterpiece. Mm -hmm. And um, they went absolutely nuts with trying to replicate the Orient Express and make it as it actually was um, during the time. And so they, um, there were two restaurant cars that had been preserved in museums, but more importantly, they found a sleeper car um, and it was just shunted off to the side of this old rail yard in Athens, Greece. And so they went there and they studied this car just exhaustively. They measured everything. They, they took pictures so they could duplicate the textures of the carpeting and the, the upholstery. 
and um, and they came back and they got their 3D modelers to uh, duplicate this train as perfectly as they possibly could. And um, so it just became this really long, extended, expensive project. Um, they were, by the end, as so often happens with uh, game development projects, they were kind of, Jordan Mechner was spending most of his time going around trying to drum up money just to get it to get it finished because he had spent his whole fortune was gone needed like patreon yeah experience. yeah 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 and um so so and then there the, another thing that's quite unique about it is if you if you've played sands of time prince of persia sands of time you probably remember that there was a this mechanic this rewind mechanic where if you if you do something wrong and you screw up, then you can quickly rewind the game. And so it's kind of like hitting rewind on a, on a cassette, on a video cassette player. And um, that mechanic actually came, started in the last express. Um, so they were trying to solve this problem that dogs a lot of adventure games of if you make a game where the plot is going the whole time, things are happening are all around you, then it's very easy to make a game where if you screw up, suddenly you can't win the game anymore. And you might not know that you can't win the game. And that's incredibly frustrating. Zero. And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, this is one of the reasons why I sometimes like adventure games more conceptually than I do <laughs> in reality. And um, so, so their solution for this was that if you went down the wrong track, quote unquote, um, you would, the game would end quite quickly and then it would automatically rewind you to the point, the last point where uh, you could get back on the right track again, so to speak. So it wouldn't. So the idea was that it wouldn't be so frustrating. And um, I, I'm not as completely sold on that mechanic as some people are. Um, but it was it was a worthy experiment, and and we're certainly worth trying. And um, for me, the the appeal of the game is just that it's. Um, I'm I'm a history guy. I love history, and so to be immersed in this different time and place is just you know that's catnip for me. Especially if and, you like trains. I mean, this is the yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. So and then it's just train, such yeah. a fascinating time and place. <laughs> I mean, 1914 is is the moment when kind of the 20th century as we know it began. Um. So so it's just. So, so to be there right on the cusp of the passing of this old world into this new modern world that we know um, is just, just an amazing thing. And um, of course, the, the sad part of the story comes that when after four years, they worked on this game for four years, spent all of Jordan Mechner's money and um, plus a whole lot of more money that Broderbund kicked in and, and other investors kicked in. And they release the game and they're all excited. What's going to happen with it? Nobody bought it. Yeah. Absolute crickets. Saying, the last express flopped like a pancake on a cold linoleum floor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that, so that was, that was yeah. it. And um, why did it flop so hard? What was the, the I think it line? was, I think it was maybe a little bit ahead of its time in the sense that, if you look at gaming in the late 1990s, it was very much, um, it was all kind of science fiction, fantasy stuff. Um, really the only two genres that were selling in huge numbers were first person shooters and real time strategy at that time. And I think uh, just a lot of people just, just didn't get it or weren't quite in the right demographic for it. I think if it had come out 10 years later, um, I think the gaming had grown up to a degree, and I think that probably there would have it would have gotten a much different reception. Um, the 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 good part of the story, the bright side, is that um, it's had a long, long afterlife. It's become a 
definitely a cult classic and um it's been ported now to iPad and Android, so uh, you can play it. It works really well on mobile. And um, for Jordan Mechner personally, of course, then he went, he said, well, the art project didn't do so well for me, so I go back to Prince of Persia. And then he made uh, Sands of Time, Prince of Persia, Sands of Time, which um, was huge. So he made, he made all of his money back in the end. And um, Tommy Pierce, I should mention, is another sad story. Um, she died in 2010 oh. of um, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And um, she never got a chance to do another game like The Last Express or to contribute so much creatively So, to another game. So, um, yeah, and I, I think it, when I say this, I think Jordan Mechner would agree with me um, that The Last Express was every bit as much her game as it was his. So it's, uh, if nothing else, it's a, it's a fine testament to her. So. Yeah, I wonder if there's, a, has there been a remake or an effort to remake this game? For... Um, I think a remake uh, could work well. Um, one problem that I definitely have with the game is that it's got this mist style movement where it's this slideshow style movement. And so, you know, you you look to the left and you get a still frame and then you look up and you get a still frame and you look down. And um, now I must say that my sense of direction is awful. <laughs> so, so this is a problem for me in life in general, but I get completely confused in those games. And and especially if, as the Last Express does sometimes, you never know how far you're rotating. So if you always rotated 90 degrees, it would be a lot easier. But sometimes you rotate 180 degrees. Sometimes you rotate 90 degrees when you click these rotation arrows. And um, so, so you know that your interface probably has a problem if your game is set on a train and people are getting lost, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so and, and, yeah. and I'm not, I, I, I do know that I'm not completely alone with having that problem. So, um, so, so I think it would be amazing to see the game if it would, as they did real mist um, with uh, actual free motion where you just can walk around like in a first person shooter or something and look up and look down as you will and it feels much more natural and oh. um i think that would be amazing but of course it's a question of always a question of money with these things and is there is there enough of a of a market there for it uh, I, I don't get the impression that jordan mechner is is super interested i think he's proud of it and he has every right to be but um i don't really get the impression that He's, he's now he's working on comic books and he's doing a lot of other kinds of writing. He's also got to make movies. So he's fulfilled that dream. And I, I don't think he's super eager to, to look back at this point, but who knows, maybe someday. Well, let's, uh, we got one last topic I wanted to cover here. I might look at some of Matt Radley Shorty's questions too, but the magic the gathering <laughs> <laughs> i know there's got to be some fans of this uh of course you talk a lot about the the card game as well as the later computer game yeah i um when i first started writing the blog i very early on i wrote about uh kind of the history of dungeons and dragons mm -hmm. didn't do it anywhere near as well as i would do it now but um, that kind of because really everything kind of stems from Dungeons and Dragons. Um, all of all of the interactive narratives that we've had since it's all kind of starts there. And so I've always kind of been interested in this space. And then when I wrote about uh, the gold box games, I know you're a big fan of the gold box games. A little bit, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I also wrote about about TSR and their history and how that that deal came together to to make those games. And so I've always kind of had a foot in that space. And then um, Magic was really interesting because uh, that's it's kind of the game that destroyed TSR. If you wanna if you wanna put it in a nutshell. Um, 
their whole market, all of the all of the people that were playing Dungeons and Dragons, seemed like ninety percent of them switched to Magic: The Gathering when that game came out, and um, it just destroyed them. So, um, so, so, it, and it's a game that I'm kind of ambivalent about. I think it's brilliantly designed game. Uh, you, it's just amazing the 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 design work, but at the same time. Um, I, I almost kind of see it as a first sign of this whole pay to uh, pay to win trend. Um, you know, to to re do really well at Magic, you have to just buy cards and buy cards and buy cards and almost um, as if by design. Yeah, almost as if. Yeah, <laughs> they were either they were either brilliant, brilliant um, Machiavellian strategists, or else they were the luckiest people in the world. So. Well, I've got, you know, pretty close friends. I mean, like I say, when I started college, it, you could still find people playing at that point. They, there, a lot of people were playing uh, the wolf, white wolf games and mm -hmm. uh, vampire, uh, the masquerade. That was sort of, but, you know, when this Magic the Gathering started to gain traction, <laughs> it's just like, what? You know, <laughs> Here, let's, yeah. let's, let's have a duel with this game. I know people that spent their tuition. <laughs> you know, the money that you get the, even the, the college bookstores are supposed to be selling textbooks you know yeah they also sold con conveniently magic the gathering <laughs> buy, who needs a textbook i'm just going to buy a whole box of these yeah magic the gathering and then you would go there a little bit later and you know 90 percent of the cards would be in the trash yeah yeah these are worthless you know these are commons you know just, yeah that's yeah you would go you would buy you would buy a hundred cards looking for that the, that one or two that you were that you wanted and just toss the rest so yeah it was they the the kids that played it they called it crack in a pack and it <laughs> it really was and so so that's kind of the that's that's the point where i'm a little bit ambivalent about the game um I think, and also you could say that, you know, if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons with your friends, it's something that it's creative. It's something that you're doing together with your friends. You know, you you all win or you all lose together. Uh, magic is just really relentlessly zero sum. You know, it's me against you, and um, that's a good. Not point. that not that that's the worst thing in the world always, but. Um, I'm not sure if that's the as healthy a form of social interaction. And when you consider as well that it was often the kids that struggled a little bit with with social life um, that were into this game, um, you may say a little bit more on the nerdier spectrum. Oh, I was going to say, that's a little um, too <laughs> so, <Nerds. laughs> so So um, maybe they could have used a little bit more of a, of a, of a different kind of social environment. And magic, um, there, there was, for some people, not for all of them by any means, but there was a really a kind of toxic quality about magic. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I... <laughs> There's so many characters. I have. I was just thinking about this guy that would show up at this uh, bookstore with a briefcase. He, he looked like he was, <laughs> you know, businessman of some sort. Looked nice, and he had this briefcase, and he'd open up and all these Magic the Gathering cards. And, <laughs> yeah, like he wouldn't duel just anybody. You know, you had to have a reputation. <laughs> I wonder where that guy is now. Yeah, there was uh, somebody left a comment on that on that article. I'm um, saying that. They had that they had been uh, they they would sit in a in a university um, cafeteria or or common hall, yeah. and um, there was and they would just be sitting there studying. But there was a group of folks that used to meet there, and they would play Dungeons and Dragons, and they would um, have have a really good time together. And then um, he started noticing that uh, this group they switched to magic. And suddenly uh, the atmosphere just got worse and it was much more, you know, kind of this hyper competitive um, uh, kind of atmosphere. And um, and he, I think the phrase he used, he, he said, it, I got the feeling more and more that it was something deeply unhealthy <laughs> for these people, uh, this game. So and that's something that spend money. They tried to, you know, these tournaments was money. It was. Yeah. Yeah. The, I don't know if gambling's quite the right analogy, but uh, 
like there's you don't think about that with Dungeons and Dragons. Like I gotta win D and D so I can make yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's nothing equivalent to that. And for me, um, playing games has never really been for me about winning. I mean, I like to win. Everybody likes to win, but for me, it's always been more just the experience. And I mean, I like to live a story and and feel like I'm in a world. And so um, that really hyper competitive, I have to win at all costs. It's always been a turnoff to me. It's just, it's just not what I come to games for. And it's, uh, it's fine if that's, you know, if that's your thing, but it's for me, it's just, it's, it's never been, been my thing. No, I'm with you on that. You know, I think that's kind of why I've been resistant to the whole esports. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I yeah, get that's... it. You know, it's great for you, but you know, it's just, uh, yeah, that's yeah. one of the that's one of the areas where I feel like a an old man with <laughs> people. <laughs> and that's also these these boys that I told you about, my friends' sons, then they start talking about esports and I just mm. okay, this is silly. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is just silly. You know, one of the things I thought was interesting about your analysis of magic, you talked about how the how the the, the rules would change with every card. Mm-hmm bring out these rules and the instructions would be on the card and that could fundamentally change the uh, the gameplay from that point forward you hadn't really thought about that before this i mean it is a really interesting game from a game development or game design perspective and it's also so when they when they made the computer game that computer game is amazing that they were able to take all, I think there are something like in the original Microprose Magic, The Gathering, I think there are like 960 cards or something. And they were to take all, they were able to take all of those cards, all with these different funky little rules printed on the front and make them all work together. And then actually make the computer. I'm I'm sure it's not a, I'm sure it's not an amazing Magic player, but that it can even play this game competently. Yeah. Uh, when you consider that this is 1997 that this game came out, I mean, it's just wow. Yeah, I think it's one of those things, sadly, that most players probably had no idea the complexity involved in the, the program. Yeah. So. And this was uh, this was Sid Meier's last project, uh, working for Micropose before he went off and founded Firaxis, his own company. And I think um that it was mainly he was Sid Meier was also a programmer and he was very interested in AI he had done this uh, CPU Bach program where um it would so it only came out on the 3DO console but it would uh generate new music in the style of Bach hmm. and uh so he was really interested in kind of generative AI before it was a a thing to the wider world and so i think that the whole appeal of magic for him was very much um let's see if we can make a computer actually play magic Alan. and do, do so competently and, and and it does so so from that perspective it's it's a stunning achievement i just my when i there's this one card where it says um you can take any other card that you have in play you can change one word on the, ah right there you have it right there no that's not it okay but i can i can tell you how this could work so you have a life tap card there where it says um, whenever any swamp target opponent controls become tapped becomes tapped gain one life well that card has actually been altered already somebody has played a card um, because that card originally said forest so somebody has played a card to switch that, that forest to swamp. Mm-hmm. And um, so uh, just imagine that you, have a, that you have a game in 1997 where you can change a word on any other card in your hand and have the computer understand that and process that and work with that. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. As, a, as somebody who doesn't really program anymore, but I did in the past, I'm just in awe <laughs> that, that this game does what it does. 
Yeah, no. And there, you, there you see, yeah. There's, there's the screen where he's actually, where we're actually changing um, one word to another on a card, and it works. So, yeah, kudos. It's amazing. And for me, this is the way I would prefer to play Magic because you get the game on the computer. You don't have to buy any more cards. <laughs> you can just, um, you can just play around with your deck and. Um, there's this whole kind of uh, pseudo RPG game that comes with it where you oh, yeah, walk like around it. in this fantasy world and duel other characters um, and um, playing I magic. I got into that part of the game. I remember playing the, the duel. Oh, that's the best part of the game. It's called Chandelier. And you, um, it's basically like an Ultima style CRPG almost, but uh, you, when you meet another character, you play magic against that character instead of, you know, having conventional combat. And then it's version, if you win, if you beat another character, then you can win nice cards. And so instead of leveling up by getting experience points and so on, um, you, you improve your character by constantly improving your deck. And this is, again, this is kind of the genius of Sid Meier. Um, so he looked at the magic game as it existed, you know, in the tabletop space. And he said, well, what is the real appeal of this game? You know, what are, what are, what does people find most exciting about this? And of course it was uh, improving your deck and getting better cards and um, just that whole kind of meta game. And so he said, well, how can we put that on the computer? And he came up with this Chandelier game. And that's something that uh, Sid Meier is just incredibly good at doing. Um, he did that with Pirates. He did that with Railroad Tycoon, looking at an, at an experience. So most game designers, they start by saying, like, I'm going to make a real-time strategy game. And then what's the theme in the plot going to be? But I get the impression that Sid Meier starts by saying, I want to give this experience what is the best uh, kind of genre and mechanical approach to yield the experience of this real world thing that I want to duplicate. And so it's kind of coming up game design from the other direction. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just, I'm in awe of Sid Meier as well in general. So. <laughs> yeah. I remember some of the later versions of this one, they started to be web and yeah. internet versions. Then the same guys that were, that I knew that were collecting the print card, <laughs> trying to get, you know, they talked a good game about, well, this is a digital card and this worked just as much as the, yeah, or even more than the print. There was some like trade way to trade cards and, you know. <laughs> well, I think for, for a lot of people though, the, the appeal of the card game really was this physicality. Um, mm -hmm. It's the same reason that, you know, people collect baseball cards or that they uh, collect albums and record albums when everything is streaming now. Um, it's just uh, the people, they, they like having that thing in their hand, you know. So so for a lot of folks, I think just the collecting aspect was huge. Um, I'm not a collector at all, so so it, so it was, so it was I fine for me. To a, I don't know if it was a comic book store or a game shop, you know, they tend to do both. But I remember yeah. one time going to one of those, and you know, there were two, probably two men about our age. <laughs> <laughs> And they were having this heated argument when I came in, you know, and I, I kind of got curious, you know, like, what, what are these guys arguing about? And it was that they were playing, uh, they were arguing about whether it was okay when you're playing Magic the Gathering to have, if you don't want to buy the actual, if you don't have the actual card, but you could take a regular card, a common card, and just draw on it. <laughs> buy it on what it was supposed to be. But that wasn't what they were arguing. I, you know, I thought it was well. They don't. They don't think you should do that. You should have to have the actual card. But no, what it was, they, the argument was, it's okay, but you have to make it look nice. You have to put some effort into the fake card. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, and and I will say, you know, there were some people that that bought Magic, uh, the physical card game. And they had they made an agreement and they said, you know, maybe we each buy one one set uh, starter set. And then maybe in six months, if we all agree, we all buy one booster pack. And if you approached it that way, then it was a great game and you would have a lot of fun with it. And 
and and everything was great. But the problem, of course, was that, you know, if you got that one guy that was maybe not so good at the game, was looking for a leg up um, and, and went off and uh, in a moment of weakness, you know, goes to the store and, and buys two or three booster packs. And then suddenly the whole kind of balance of power is screwed up. And then everybody else is saying, oh, you know, I have to get some booster packs of my own so I can keep up with this guy. And then it just, oh, it just spirals. Magazines would print like the, this is the winning hand. Or this is the winning deck, you know, and then the, yeah. all these guys would run to the card stores and they had already would have opened up all the packs and have the individual cards on sale for, you know, maybe a hundred dollars for that card. Uh, this yeah. part of this deck. So I think I think the stores were. I don't think they were allowed to open the the the, the sets, but uh -huh. uh, there was a huge used market. Oh yeah. yeah. I don't know how legal. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. The one the one really funny thing about all of this is in the original rules of Magic, um, there was there was something called an ante, where if you would play. Um, each when you played a match, each player uh, would draw a card at random from their deck and set it down, and that would be their ante. And if they lost the game, then the player that won would get to take that card. But the problem with this was that it was actually gambling because these cards um, were worth quite some money in a lot of in a lot of cases. So you had Wizards of the Coast actually. Uh, doing kind of sanctioned the gambling with um, a lot of people that were often quite far under the age of 18. Uh, and so you've got them like tempting all of these teenagers to say, oh, yeah, you go come gamble with, with our game. And it was in a lot of American states, it was actually illegal <laughs> because there are gambling after lines. pinball, you know, way back in the day. <laughs> yeah. So they, so they, so Wizards of the Coast got um, in quite some trouble and they, they had to really hastily uh, get rid of all of these anti, this anti rule and these anti cards. And um, it's, it all kind of got flushed down the memory hole. You know, we, no, you never. We never sanctioned gambling with Magic the Gathering. Uh, but one interesting thing is that the, the Micropose Magic game was does still have the anti-cards and the anti-rules. So it was actually, it's the last remnant of that. Mm -hmm. um, by the time it came out, that had already been abolished from the, from the physical card game. And so... So a, a lot of people that are really into magic today, they like to go back and play this microprose game because it really is a different world. It's much more kind of loosey goosey and um, the rules have not been refined. And uh, there's cards that are just massively overpowered and it's not balanced as it is today. But at the same time, um, I think you can almost overbalance a game. And sometimes it's fun just to have this kind of, this kind of craziness. Oh, yeah. And so, so a lot of people that that know Magic today, they 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 still love this Chandela game. It's it's another game like The Last Express that's kind of a cult classic, even though it's really really hard to get running on Windows today. <laughs> but about, you don't have to worry about Wizards of the Coast changing the tournament rules and banning. No, them. no. Jack, you know. There's actually a group of people who. Um, uh, they said they haven't, I don't think they've worked on it in years, but um, around 2010 or so, they came out. They basically reverse engineered the Microprose Magic game and put all of the cards that had come out between 1997 and 2010 into the game. And um, so it's still the old Microprose game, but they just moved all of the data from the new cards and the new graphics oh. and so on. And so they made this whole new magic with... Um, I said the Micropose game had 900 and something cards. I don't even know how many cards uh, their new version has. So it's it's another one that people still love and still still play to this day. Yeah, just thinking too how it influenced a lot of CRPG series of the time. Like a, I was playing a lot of Might and Magic, one of my favorite yeah. series, and they yeah. had a Arco Mage, <laughs> yeah. card geek, you know, collectible card game built into it. And, you know, I think The Witcher has one too, right? I, uh, if you've, I don't know if you've ever played the strategy game Master of Magic. 
but that game also, um, I think that's probably the first uh, digital game where you see the influence of Magic. Uh, Magic, Magic the Card Game came out in 1993, and this Microprose Master of Magic strategy game, um, which was not an official Magic game. It was just called Master of Magic, but um, it's a very beloved strategy game. Yeah. And it came out in late 1994. And the, but the magic system in that game has all of these colors. Um, everything in Magic the Gathering is color coded. So you have different colors of mana uh, for different and different colors of spells. And you can that's also in the Master of Magic game. So you can already see barely a year after the card game came out, you can already see the influence in computer games. Yeah, I feel like I need to do the couple of these or all these games for future match chats. You know, it'd be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I kind of been a little bit resistant to some of the card stuff, but yeah, time to jump in. <laughs> uh, let's see. What did I have another? I thought I had another question about magic, but uh, oh, oh, I remember what I was thinking about. Yeah, I remember uh recently, I guess it's probably in a couple of years now, but I thought when all this talk was in the air about these NFTs, do you remember that in the the NFTs, like what Bitcoin. does that stand for? It's kind oh, of like okay. the Bitcoin principle applied to other things. Yeah. A lot of people hate it. <laughs> I would probably say, you know, I hated the idea. It's got a bunch of problems. But anyway, I just think when they were talking about this, that this would be something that Wizards of the Coast would probably be <laughs> and exploiting because it's a way to take these, you know, at least my understanding was the idea behind it. I don't know how successful it was, was that you could make a sort of a digital like a card uh, but it would have this unique sort of id or print yeah you know so it would be the only one of its kind but you know apparently that just all collapsed yeah, yeah, <laughs> the yeah. end of the... Uh, but it seemed like an effort to try to get around some of the issues that we that you talked about here with the you know the collecting of the physical cards versus the online versions were really yeah. to stop you from having why why not just make more cards you know yeah 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 <laughs> Yeah, it's very it's very hard to introduce scarcity into yeah a yeah there we go. That is the word scarcity. Yeah, the digital realm doesn't really make much sense. Yeah, when I was when I was doing this Magic the Gathering article, I originally I had a whole big frame story that was it was going to also tell about uh, how Wizards of the Coast just demolished TSR. And then just completely beat them down to nothing and then came and bought them. So it was kind of like, you know, I'm going to beat you up and then now I'm going to take your lunch. And um, but in the end, I, I left that part out because it was just the article was getting too big and it was getting too awkward. But I think I'm going to tell I want, feeling before too long, I'm going to write about Baldur's Gate. And I think I'm going to tell that story then because that would be a, that would be a nice lead up to Baldur's Gate. Yeah. So, yeah. There for that. Well, Jimmy, it's been a great chat. Well, thanks. I've enjoyed it a lot as well. I don't know. Is there something else you wanted to talk about? Any um, Alders Gate project coming out? Sounds like uh, <laughs> uh, that's a that's I've just played Baldur's Gate, um, but that's the first one or the third the one? first one. The yeah. first one. I was really impressed with the third one, by the way. Yeah, my problem is. Um, I've heard great things about it. If you actually, if you go to Moby Games and you do this um, browse, if you just go to the browse games page, mm -hmm. um, it has the highest rating of any game <laughs> on Moby Games right now. I was one of these. I was so skeptical that they would be able to do something as good as the first two. Uh -huh. I mean, I was just like, I would if they had just been as good as those, I would have been very impressed yeah. you know i i think in a lot of ways they even surpassed it yeah yeah well, it's just so, really i mean yeah, I, I, I i feel i feel bad a lot because i i kind of would like to to play these newer games but my problem is that if i'm going to keep up with with the writing and the blog then i just don't have time and sometimes i've actually thought that well maybe i should just blow up the whole history angle and just write about games i think are cool or interesting but um no. I, I i think that the history angle is kind of my shtick so i think i'm gonna I have a niche you know i've thought about this a lot too and stuff i do and 
yeah, you could chase. Why the world probably doesn't need another Baldur's Gate three video? I mean, there's probably yeah, yeah. How many you know of those you know versus these games like the ones we've been talking about here? But, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, maybe yeah. people are curious. Oh, I've heard of the Last Express. You know, what's, what's that all about? You know, yeah, yeah. You know, like China, and there like, is a there is a charm to the older games in that they're made by smaller teams and uh, they're much more kind of individual visions instead of. Um, so much any of these big AAA games of today, you know, they're just uh, kind of focus grouped and product tested to death. And at some point they kind of lose. Um, I mean, they're amazing to look at, of course, but they, they, they start to lose some of their personality. So um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think older games are better necessarily. I think they're just different and maybe to some extent they're that I'm just more comfortable in that world <laughs> being being a middle-aged guy as i am so yeah it's always risky trying to pick what game that's out now are we still going to care about yeah a couple years from i mean forget about 20 years later you know so when you're looking back you see these titles if, if somebody's still talking about it and still modding it and there's still some uh some interest in it you know that really has to be something special yeah 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 yeah, and it's and back back in the day. I mean, if you had told you know Richard Garriott that people would still be talking about Ultima Four today, he would have looked at you. <laughs> what? What? But he's a yeah, guy. Um, they have they have they have an enduring life. I don't know. Don't know if they'll endure past our generation, but certainly as long as we're around, they'll they'll be talked about. Let me ask one of the uh, wrap up here. I want to get one of Matt Bradley Shurgi's questions in. We kind of touched on a lot of his topics hmm. that he suggested, but I thought this was pretty cool. So have you ever written any blogs that you decided not to publish? Um, Very, very rarely. Uh, the two that I remember, um, actually I've only written one complete article that I didn't publish. And that was... Um, so I go from time to time to the Strong Museum of Play up in Rochester. Yeah. Uh, they, have a, they have a really great archive up there. Um, they have a big donations, big archives from, ooh, Bob Bates of Legend Entertainment and uh, Scott Adams and uh, Jordan Mechner has an archive up there. Uh, Her Interactive, we get all the Nancy Drew games. I love those. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've had them on the show a couple of times. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. And uh, Brian Fargo donated a lot of his papers, so there's a big interplay uh, archive up there. And the one I remember writing was, um, the, in the interplay art archive, there's a lot of stuff on uh, games that never got made. So I had an article called uh, The Interplay Games That Weren't. And I wrote the whole article and in the end, I just thought it wasn't interesting. And that's always, my, my motto as a writer is always don't be boring. And so if, if, if I'm reading something and I'm really, of course, interested in this field and it's not interesting to me, then I, then I know something's wrong. So in the end, I didn't publish that article. Um, there have been a number, there's always a number of ideas that I have for articles and I kind of sit down and start to do the research and maybe start to think about a, a outline and so on and maybe even start writing, but then I just know it's not working. Mm -hmm. I remember once I, when I wrote about Sim City years ago, uh, the original 1989 Sim City, I had this plan that I was going to do. 64 version of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had this plan that I was going to do one article on the making of it. And then I was going to have do a, one or more articles on uh, connecting it to uh, city planning as it actually works and as it actually exists in the real world and ask, is this really useful for city planning and so on. And um, so I got, I got, I went to the library. I had this 
big pile of books <laughs> about city planning. And I was, I was all gung ho to do this. And I just, I just realized really quickly, this just isn't working. I don't have, the, I don't have the knowledge to do this. And I think, I, I think the game is too simplistic to really that early. I mean, it's gotten, I'm sure it's gotten more complicated now, but um, that early Sim City was just, it's just not, it's just not working. So I had actually, that's the, the probably the only time when I actually had published an article as a part one. And then I had to come kind of sheepishly later and say, uh, that's going to be the only part, actually, folks, because it's just not working. Um, and then sometimes I have ideas that um, I think better of. Um, so each year when I, um, each year in blog time, so historical year, I always publish kind of a state of the blog post and um, talk about what's coming up for that year. Mm -hmm. uh, it also helps me usually drum, usually uh, people get excited and then there come a few new patrons and so on when I do that. And so, um, and then it's also, but the most important thing is that it's a good forum for people to suggest things that maybe I overlooked. And um, so there's been, oh, always when I do that, there's there's two or three articles I don't end up writing um, that that I say I'm going to write that I don't end up writing. And I remember one recently was, um, I don't know, do you remember uh, this game Battle Cruiser 3000 AD? That became, it became this big joke because it was, it was, it was, it was released and it was the, okay, the, the developer behind this game was um, kind of a narcissist and um, he was all over the news groups and so on and saying that this game was going to be the best game ever made. Battle Cruiser and, 3000 AD. Yeah, it's a whole, it's a whole epic unto itself, the story of this game. And, um, oh, Derek Smart. Yes. The, 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 the word around the internet was always that you don't say Derek Smart's name out loud because if you do, he would show up. Uh -oh. he, he would just cruise, <laughs> he would just cruise the internet looking for picking fights with people. And, um, so he came, so it came out with this game and, um, it's it, all technical it, controversy. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it was, it was so here. The flame war lasted for several years, garnering over seventy thousand posts. So he would just stir this stuff up on the internet, and um, the game was really, really bad when it came out. It was half finished. It was loaded with bugs, and he kept trying to. Um, finish the game and patch it. And meanwhile, he was involved in all these flame wars and it was, it was just mass, it was massively over ambitious and it was never gonna, it was never gonna work. And, um, and there's also, there's this famous, famous, uh, this goes back to the, to the porn angle, I suppose. There was this famous advertisement that, that came out with this game where it was a woman, um, kind of a supermodel looking woman in a um, oh, little, yeah. little teddy. Yeah, and she said, and she was standing there in this little lacy teddy. And she was saying, um, come to bed, honey, come to bed. And then you saw the, the, the person who was, who she was talking to was uh, playing this battle cruiser 3000 AD game saying, no, 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 not now. I have one more turn here. I have to keep playing. And so it, it was absolutely the tackiest gaming advertisement you'll ever see. And maybe you can find it on the internet and show show your show your viewers. I don't know but, how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I so I thought I was gonna write this article and I was gonna make it I was gonna make it funny. Is that there? And that's not it. Oh yeah, that's it. That's that's one of them. But there's there's uh -huh. more. I actually haven't seen that one. <laughs> that's almost worse. <laughs> oh man. Oh yeah. And this F. Maybe we should not look at the side. Yeah. <laughs> so 
<laughs> so then, um, so then, but in the end, I thought I thought I was going to make it kind of a satire and make it funny and so on. But in the end, I decided it was just kind of mean spirited, and I didn't do it. And so, so I do that. I do that kind of thing sometimes when I when I I think something is a good idea, and then right, I try to I try to I try to stay positive. Let me put it that way. And so, yeah, me too. Um, yeah, I just if. I would rather, I would rather in the end, I would rather write a positive article than making fun of something, even if it richly deserves to be made fun of as, as, in, as in this case. But um, yeah, so, so that happens from time to time. But, I kind of um, walk that line myself because there's lots of terrible games that I, I yeah, hate. Yeah. It'd be a fun video and I could criticize the thing, but you know, some of those people might still be around. Yeah, and... <laughs> One thing, I don't want you know they've, no, they've, they've had enough hate you know for whatever yeah yeah and you know in the end i think not too many people make games um for any other they if, they, if somebody makes a game then they probably are not genuinely trying to show somebody somebody else a good time and um it's, do we really need to dump on them for that i mean it's just not necessary so so yeah sometimes i i rethink you're nice like that. yeah <laughs> but um but yeah, it's it's not something that happens all that often for me. I'm a fairly efficient writer. I, I like to use what I write. <laughs> Otherwise, I've wasted a lot of time. So we certainly got some great articles here. I mean, this is all I mean, we just kind of scratched the surface, but so many more things we could have talked about. Realms of the Haunting, I see the Star Trek Diablo, Rogue, Warcraft, Tomb Raider. I mean. <laughs> yeah, I'm into wow. this. I'm into this wow. 3D explosion of the of the 1990s now. Right. I did make I did make fun of realms of the haunting. I have to admit. <laughs> <laughs> talking about over ambitious games. <laughs> I keep thinking about Star Citizen. I haven't heard for, about that in a while. Is that still? Um, uh, I heard that they just supposedly they said that. So they were had the main Star Citizen game and the online game, and then they were also supposed to have a narrative-driven game like the old Wing Commander games, and that was called Squadron Forty Two, and I believe they just released a footage or a demo or something of that, and they said that that's supposed to be coming out quite soon. Um, quite soon. Yeah, but of course, who knows what "quite soon" means at this point. There's also these guys that, um, so I think back in about 2010 or so, these guys that made uh, the Space Quest games for Sierra, they had a Kickstarter where they, they were going to make a new, they couldn't call it Space Quest because somebody else owned the trademarks, but they called it Space Venture or something like that. And... I remember at the time I was talking to a Mark friend Prince of mine. Scott Murphy, yeah, I, haven't, yeah. I, haven't I was talking. That. I was talking to a friend of mine who really, really loves Space Quest, and he said, um, "Oh, there's going to be a new Space Quest game." So I, so I went and I looked at the Kickstarter, and even at that time, I'd been around game development enough that I, that I, I, I read, I read everything that they were planning and so on, and I said that game they said this game was going to be made within a year of the kickstarter being finished and i i told him that game is never going to get done and he said oh you're being so cynical and this is and i'm then and it's going to be great and i said okay that's fine spend your money that's that's good and so as of now 2023 it's been like 13 years or something and this game is still theoretically anyway in development so I, every time I talk to oh, that friend, I, I, I tell him that. Do you? How's it? How's it going with the space venture yeah. game? <laughs> well, I know with the Star Citizen people, they were spending thousands and thousands of dollars to get these special ships. That was oh, like, there are some that is that are that are in for like hundred thousand dollars. It's just I look mind back. The amazing thing to me is that any of those games that got actually got made and were good. I mean, well, you know, the whole, the so whole easy Kickstarter, the, the, the whole Kickstarter thing is kind of shows. So back in the, like in the nineties, the publishers were the evil ones, you know, they were always saying, Oh, you, you have to 
cut back on your ambition. You have to make it for this amount of money. You have to get this game done. And, and all of the creative people in the industry were saying, Oh, you know, they're, they're, we're these, we're these artists, we're these auteurs and they're, um, you know, spoiling everything with all of their bean cutter stuff. And so now with this Kickstarter era, you suddenly realize that, well, maybe the business people actually had a purpose, you know, that they actually could say, okay, here's your budget. Here's what we have to do. Here's the amount of time you have. Let's get this game done. And because obviously some people have done really well off Kickstarter, like Brian Fargo's projects have gone really well, but that's elite dangerous also went well, but um, yeah, some of these folks, it's just. Yeah. Fargo is really good. I mean, I was, I remember interviewing him before the Kickstarter thing and we, we were talking about like wasteland and things like that. And he's like, well, there's, there's no way a publisher, I could never get a publisher interested in this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in this game. So I mean, for, he was like the, the reason Kickstarter, <laughs> yeah, you know, the reason it was there so good, I guess, or reason it even existed was for projects like that. So if, if there was a lot of doubt from publishers, but the fans, yeah. you know, could, yeah, yeah, I mean, that was a sort of a really exemplary case of that. <laughs> On the yeah. other hand, uh, I mean, we know so many stories about develop uh, developers that had these great ideas, and if there's nobody there to tell them, no. <laughs> we're not exactly. doing that cut that exactly. you know, cut that cut that you know we'll get yeah. this part made and then we'll put that out and yeah yeah it goes, so so they always say politics is the art of the possible i think uh game development is the art of the possible as well you have to figure out where where that line is and what you can actually get done in a reasonable amount of time and um that's something that a lot of creative people are unfortunately not so good at that's where you need the, the bean counters to step in. Sounds like a perfect stopping point. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. I, I enjoyed this a lot. Yeah, and thank you been, for been, all of your been reading your stuff for so long. It's fun, fun to re-meet. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for all of your interviews as well. You're one of my go-to stops when I'm going for a new topic, I always say. Okay, let's see if Matt Chat has done an interview with, with this person or, or yeah. So um, yeah, thank you for that. You're, you're a valuable resource for me. You too. And... That's all for this week's episode. I <laughs> hope you guys enjoyed that. <laughs> See, I told you you like Jimmy. A lot of great stuff. You know, at some point, I'd really like to take a tour of uh, Denmark, Norway, uh, maybe even Sweden, <laughs> maybe even Germany. <laughs> and I got a lot of friends, that, you know, a lot of match. Oh, you guys are from there. Uh, but I noticed that <clears throat> Denmark, for whatever reason, is where I get a lot of my pipe tobacco. I guess they grow it here in Virginia, ship it over there, and blend it, and work their magic on it, and ship it back. <laughs> <laughs> you know who knows what's going on but apparently it's a big business there so pretty pretty cool uh let's see oh well first of all i want to thank you uh, very very much for supporting the show keeping matt chat chatting <laughs> keeping uh, this matt burton guy on the youtubes could not and would not do it without you and it's really really cool of you to support the show really thank you uh, so much for that uh, to everyone who has signed up but if, unlike Richard Simmons here, you have not taken that time to set up an account over on Patreon, folks, it takes a couple of minutes. Uh, pop over there. You're really going to like it. It's easy. It's fun. It's fast. you like the show a lot more. You'll be part of the, the, the team in the dungeon with me slaying. We'll, we'll go into the cellar together, slay those rats together. I uh, just need you to take a few minutes, pop over to Patreon, a couple of bucks. Come on. <laughs> you know you want to. <laughs> Become a rat run, buddy. All right. What about that news from the Met Cave? Oh, man, we got a lot of news. But, you know, one advantage, I guess, of taking a... When there's a delay uh, in getting the shows out, it gives more time for the news to accumulate. Uh, remember, one of the advantages of being on Patreon, being a rat run, you get the Discord, and you get all the news... Uh, right as it comes out 
uh, rather than waiting on uh, me to read it. But uh, anyway, let's jump in. We've got Miko, good old Miko, uh, writes in about a game called The Iron Oath. This is out on Steam now. Uh, command, uh, command, endure, and prosper in The Iron Oath, a turn-based tactical, oh, what sweet music. <laughs> turn-based tactical RPG. Are there sweeter sounds in the English language? I don't know. Anyway, uh, turn-based tactical RPG where the fate of your mercenary company rests on your decisions. Customize your roster. I thought I said rooster. I was about to say, customize your rooster. Now, that'd be a fun game. Uh, build your renown and discover the secrets that await in the medieval fantasy realm of Calm. Developed by Curious Panda Games, it's only $24.99 over on Steam. Chris Wingard, programmer, designer, along with Nick Mueller, an artist and designer. So we've got a programmer and an artist, and they're both dipping their hands into the design tray. So, and I haven't played it yet. If you have, let me know what you think. Sure does look good. All right, moving on. Snap, snappy, snap, snapper. Uh, very snappy guy. Uh, uh, writes in about wizardry. The Five Ordeals. Uh, this is out from 59 Studio. Uh, now, if you're a fan of the Wizardry series, uh, you know, I played the, the first one's probably my favorite. <laughs> it's going way back. <laughs> uh, or some people like the seventh one, of course. Or is it eight? Uh, anyway, one of those. Uh, wizardry 1 to 5. Which one did Brenda do? Uh, this is probably the best of the later ones. Uh, let's see. This does not include dungeon layouts, unique... Oh, uh... Let me back up a little bit. So this game has nothing to do with Wizardry 1 through 5. It does not include dungeon layouts, unique names, and the UI and graphics of those things. Classic hardcore gameplay. Experience a deep dungeon crawling RPG. The game was created by the main staff that worked on the popular RPG series back in 2006. In this game, players can experience many different dungeon crawls using the base system. Available for the first time on Steam and outside of Japan with enhancements to the UI, $39.99. So, <laughs> a bit pricey perhaps, but you know, if you're a fan of this genre, and uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize that the Wizardry series has been thriving apparently all this time over in Japan, uh, but not all of those Wizardries made it over here. Uh, so maybe this is the start of a, uh, several games we'll, we'll have to see. But again, uh, I haven't played this one either, I'm afraid, so if you have played Wizardry the Five Ordeals, be sure to chime in in the commentary section and comment about whether you think it's worth $39.99. All right, then Miko and Snap Snapper. <laughs> you know, it's going to be good when they both write in about something. Uh, this is a game simply called Beast. This is long presumed dead. A veteran returns from a 10-year-long Ottoman slavery. His Carpathian homeland is feebly reigned by the demented Prophet King. Its lands ruined by raiders and cursed with a hellish plague. Is this fiction? <laughs> or is this contemporary politics? I don't know. The everything he loved and cherished is either gone or has changed beyond recognition. All he has left is a soldier's loyalty and a holy quest to end the plague. Face hordes of demons as well as his inner demons. You must help him see it through no matter the cost. Well, the cost is $24.99 uh, over on Steam. Now, this is an early access, uh, but if you read the fine print, they say it's almost ready for official release. A couple of months, they say, uh, and this will be out. Uh, so it might be a good time to pick it up while it's still in early access, maybe a little cheaper. Uh, I don't know, but anyway, it sure does look good. Uh, I'm not going to show the uh, not safe for work parts, but, you know, it's not something you probably want to have on at the... Uh, at the office, there were little kids around, sounds like. Uh, let me just a couple little things here. Uh, since the last episode, we've got uh, FPS, First Person Shooter, the definitive RPG documentary. Uh, you remember I had on, uh, uh, yeah, David Craddock on the show not too long ago talking about this. Well, it's out, and I got the full package here. It looks like I got a, a little mini poster. I got several big posters. I'm not going to show those. Uh, uh, right now, but as you can see, it's still sealed, <laughs> so I haven't I gotten a chance to watch. You know, it's just been so, um, it's been pretty busy here. <laughs> I can't imagine if I haven't even been able to watch this documentary. Uh, so anyway, no spoilers on this. I'm going to open it up, uh, watch it this weekend. Really looking forward to that. Uh, and let's see, uh, yeah, I got my copy of John Romero's book finally, Doom Guy, Life in First Person. This is the uh, signed copy. 
Well, like I said, we can see. I don't know if you'll be able to see this. Uh, yeah, there it is. <laughs> John Romero. And a little certificate of authenticity. That's really cool. Uh, and then let's see. I got yet more stuff. I got Michael Whitworth. He sent me this a while back. And I don't remember if I, I mentioned it on the show. He's apparently writing fiction now. Vivian Van Tassel and the Secret of Midnight Lake. Really cool cover. This is advanced reader's copy, not for sale or quotation. So I can't even quote from this. <laughs> I guess I, maybe I'm not even supposed to show you the cover. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, congratulations, uh, Michael. It was really cool. And then uh, finally, <laughs> just kind of for fun, <laughs> you know, there's a store called Dollar Tree. Uh, used to be you could buy stuff in there for a dollar, this Dollar Tree. Uh, now I think it's more like a dollar fifty-nine. Doesn't quite have the same ring to it. Uh, but I'm always noticing these little toys in there called Final Faction, and they apparently have a comic series. And the reason I thought this was cool, apparently this is all done in-house through Dollar Tree. They have their comics. I think there might be a cartoon and a toy line, <laughs> just all unique <laughs> uh, to them. I don't know if they have a, a game yet, uh, but I don't know. Just kind of a fun collectible, I thought. Uh, so if you ever see a Dollar Tree, you might pop over to the uh, book section and find these comics, uh, if you like comics, of course. All right, I think that will pretty much do it. Am I forgetting something? I hope not. <laughs> uh, so anyway, let's wrap it up with a quote. And I got a quote. Uh, we talked a lot about Jordan Mechner uh, in this uh, interview with Jimmy. And I found a pretty good quote from him. This is from The Making of Karateka. Karateka? Karateka? How do you say it? <laughs> Many have come to blows over the pronunciation of that game. Karateka. I'll just go with that. Anyway, the quote goes something like this. If the themes are missing, you get a trivial, boring story. But if the actions are as grandiose as the themes, you get a myth, which is harder for contemporary audiences to identify with. What you need to do is translate the myth into modern, small-scale terms. So some thoughts to ponder there by one of the great game designers, Jordan Mechner. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that, and I'll see you next time.